are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is a soft one. This was a woman murdered by her friends. How Gemma Hayter was failed. Now a young woman finding independence with her heart of gold leading her through life was taken advantage of by people she believed were her friends. No matter how many people begged these social services to help her, no one came to her rescue. Her family had been trying since she was a child and had never given up. I believe what happened to her could have been prevented. And I think that's the most heartbreaking part of all. By the way, I post so much content like this. It's my absolute passion to tell these stories and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if you would like to support me in doing that, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on, giving this video a thumbs up and leaving a nice comment down below. I also want to thank today's sponsor, which is Skillshare, which is a website offering online classes and things like film and video, marketing, productivity, entrepreneurship, creative writing. It's literally perfect for creative people who don't want to leave their house like me. And there are thousands of classes which are mostly under an hour. So you basically can just fit it in anytime you can in your busy schedule and learn new things, which is what I love. And I've also been looking into leadership classes, which I think are so, so important and something that we don't even think about taking. But I found some on Skillshare and I think that right now especially we are all learning how powerful our voices can be and the need to speak up about what you believe in and so I have really been trying to figure out the best way to do that and these classes are helping tremendously. I've specifically been watching Simon Sinek and he has a presentation essentials video, how to share ideas that inspire action. And it really has changed the way that I want to, you know, speak to people and speak out. So it's definitely one that I recommend. Skillshare is actually less than $10 a month and you get no ads on the videos that you're watching. So Skillshare has actually offered the first 1,000 of you guys, you gems, that click the link below. You guys will get a two month free trial for the premium membership. So thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now let's get back to the story. By the way, I just realized that my microphone was not on for that part, so the sound will be better from here. So sorry about that. But it was 2012 in Warwickshire, England, and the Hayter family lived in a place called Rugby. Now, Gemma was a 27-year-old beautiful soul who had just moved out on her own. This was a huge deal for her because she was normally with her family 24-7, and her mother, Sue, and she also had a stepfather that she had lived with before, as well as an older sister named Nikki and an older brother named Neil. Gemma was the baby of the family, and of of course, she was spoiled and loved like the baby of the family always is, but from the very beginning of her life, people noticed that she was a bit different. She was quite the little miracle. And they noticed that she kind of had a harder time as far as learning like other people and doing things like other people did. She definitely had different ways that she liked to live. Her family realized that she functioned very differently, but to Gemma herself, she carried on like normal because that's all she had ever known. And so Gemma was quite this, you know, innocent character who was the type to look at everyone as a really good person and never saw the ill intentions in anybody. She was always nice no matter who you were, no matter what you did to her. When I was learning about her, I actually thought that her name fit her perfectly because her family and friends would call her Jem. And of course you guys are my gems and that is exactly what she was as well just such a rare soul. She was born so loving, she wanted cuddles all the time, and she just loved being around friends. She had so much love and respect for everybody she met, and she was always kind of in her own world. Like, the world around her didn't really bother her because she had her own. As she grew older, her family suspected that Gemma was on the spectrum for autism. However, this is where the problems began because no one wanted to diagnose her with anything. She was going for test after test and they all came back negative and so 
they really couldn't do anything about it. And the problem with this is that, you know, one person would say she's definitely has this diagnosis. However, the next person looked at her would say, it's not that we're not diagnosing her that it's this. The next person would completely X that one. And so it was just like a constant cycle of people saying that something was wrong, but not wanting to say what. It wasn't like there was just nothing they could find. She was having so many tests, it was just a part of her life. And the most frustrating part was if she didn't have a diagnosis, she wasn't going to get help. And with that lack of help, people knew that something was off, but she really was kind of forced to live like normal, even though that's not how her brain functioned, which was quite unfair to her and to her family. And there was just nothing they could do about it. So when she moved on as, she, as an adult to her supportive housing apartment, no one really thought that this was a huge change, except her and her family who knew how big this really was for her. Jimmy was so happy to be independent, but her family was really worried about her and they had a right to be. Because on August 9th of 2000, before anyone knew Jimmy was even missing, she would be found by a jogger on Hilly Road at around 5.30 a.m. She was deceased lying on an unused railway and she had a trash bag over her head. She was horrifically beaten with a broken nose and a stab wound to the back of her neck and it appeared as though someone has stomped on her head. Her cause of death was ruled actually to be drowning from the blood in her nose and 50 injuries were thought to be on her body. Upon seeing this scene, investigators traced the footsteps, of course, back to what she was doing the previous night and who she was with. And her family said that they believe that she was with some friends that she was always with, including a girl named Chantelle Booth. Investigators went to the apartment complex of Gemma as well as Chantelle to see if there was any surveillance footage of her being with them that night because of course they couldn't just go off speculation. And thankfully there were surveillance cameras in the area. Now, the two apartments, Jimma and Chantel's, were only about two miles away. Now, looking at the footage at Chantel's place, investigators found that just past midnight, of course, on the day she would be found, she was seen leaving Chantel's apartment with five people. They appeared to all be together. They were walking in the same direction. This was in the direction of Jimma's place and Jimma was strangely enough holding up a tissue to her nose. Now, eventually they did go out of shot and there wasn't any surveillance footage to show what happened afterwards, but they never made it to Gemma's place. Now, this was also in the direction of the unused railway. And when the group came into shot, once again, there was only five and Gemma wasn't there. This was around 109 to 130 and Jimma would be found on the railway four hours later. As investigators looked into these five individuals who were said to be Jimma's friends, they found that Chantel Booth was a 21-year-old who was living with her boyfriend in that apartment, and he was 19-year-old Daniel Newstead, and there was also a man with them who was 19-year-old Duncan Edwards, who lived with his mother nearby, and there was also another couple, Joe Boyer, who was 17, and Jessica Linez, who was 18, who were together and living in a different apartment. As they collected more information, they also looked at the social media, because of course this was in 2010. So they looked at the social media of these individuals. They found that Jessica had written a status after Gemma had been found, where she said, wants to know what happened on Hilly Road. Is it true they found a body? Now, this wouldn't be of concern to anybody reading this Facebook status because she just seemed like a very concerned individual who wanted to know what had happened until you realize that she was with her just hours prior to her murder. Investigators found that these six individuals, these five friends and Gemma, had been together quite a bit and they were constantly going places together and hanging out and Chantel was actually Gemma's longest friend. She had known her the longest and since Gemma didn't really have the best luck with relationships, she was really happy to have made a friend. And Chantel was always said to stick by her side. Her family, though, said that they were worried that Chantel was going to take advantage of Gemma because they didn't know why she was necessarily hanging out with Gemma. Not that they believed Gemma didn't deserve friends, but they just knew that Gemma had a hard time keeping them. 
and she struggled and so they just thought that it was quite unusual. Now Chantel of course introduced Gemma to all of her friends and they made this one big group but these individuals were known by the police, each kind of for different things. But like I said, the couples lived two miles away from Gemma at the time and Duncan lived with his mother. But Daniel Newstead, Chantel's boyfriend, who she lived with, was the main name that they were familiar with. And this was because he had been convicted of many different offenses dating back to six years prior. I mean, at one point, he had a metal bar and a knife and he was known to be violent towards women, including his mother and his sister, his previous girlfriend, Chantel, who was just a violent individual. You know, mental health tests show that he had no mental illness, but Daniel did drugs, he had anger issues, and he wasn't the only one in the group with issues. Chantel had actually been put on probation for committing grievous bodily harm with an unknown individual or to an unknown individual. And there was also an accident that was alleged to happen months prior to Jim's murder where Chantel and Jessica, another girl in the group, had gotten in trouble for harassing and bullying a vulnerable person. Duncan, who was the man that lived with his mother, he was also on the police's radar because he had been convicted of nine different offenses and was being investigated for nine more. Now, Joe and Jessica, the other couple, they were said to have minor things against them, but it still wasn't the best record for them either. And Jessica, of course, was with Chantel when they were warned about be being, you know, aggressive to other people, especially vulnerable people. And Joe had been stopped and um, talked to about having weed. Chantel and Jessica had both actually grown up in the social services and had had children who went back into, you know, foster care social services as well so they did not have any children that they were raising at that time and all of these individuals were not a good combination especially not for a young innocent woman who couldn't stand up for herself this was to no fault of Gemma. this was just her good nature her belief that all people had a good heart like she did strangely enough before her murder Gemma had actually contacted the police about chantelle but only saying that chantelle's purse had been stolen now, that is when they started going back a little bit further than that night because they didn't know what happened. They didn't know if there was a lead up to this, if she could have been meeting somebody. So they went three days prior to when her body was found. And that is when surveillance footage caught Gemma with these friends. And that's a term I say loosely, but that's just how we're going to, you know, categorize them so it makes sense for this video. But she was spotted with these friends at Rugby Town Center. This is a place where you can go out to different bars and kind of just have a night out. This was Saturday, August 7th. And one doorman actually asked Chantel, as well as everybody else, to see their IDs because, well, some of them, you know, were underage. Although I guess this is in England, so they wouldn't have been underage. One of them would have been, but they were young looking, all of them, even the ones who were of age. And Gemma was the type to kind of joke about things. And so when Chantel got out her ID, Gemma joked with the doorman, oh, she's only 16. Chantel was actually 21. She was completely legal at this time, but the doorman did not take this joke lightly and kick them out of the bar. All of her friends were extremely angry at Gemma and they actually started going to other bars and trying to get in and couldn't. This was because of something called the pub watch scheme, which is where the different bars in the area would talk to one another about people, underage people trying to get into these bars. And so they were basically locked out of all of these bars and they were so angry at Gemma. And this actually caused kind of a scene and now cctv footage caught that while they were all kind of walking around and trying to get in somewhere chantelle would actually shove Gemma away from the group as they all walked away from her now Gemma just thought that you know chantelle was a little upset but she was doing what was best for everybody and so she continued to go with them that night and the next day they were at you know their own apartments and it was a sunday and chantelle and daniel decided to have everyone over to their place for lunch 
Joe, Jessica, and Duncan got there around 4 to 5 p.m. and everyone was smoking weed and drinking for hours and that is when they would finally invite Gemma. This was confirmed by text messages between Chantel and Gemma where Chantel asked her to come over and after that she never made it home. Investigators brought in these five individuals and immediately realized that no empathy was found towards Gemma and her being found even by her supposed friends. Now, eventually, it would also see that there was no remorse in the actual murder of her either. Chantel's apartment was searched and blood was found on the radiator as well as all the way up the wall and this was matched to Gemma. These five were questioned. They began to tell the stories of what happened that night and I couldn't find exactly who said what. But from what I heard, they all pretty much had the same statement. The only difference was they were all blaming each other and saying that they personally had nothing to do with it. The night of the 8th, when Gemma arrived at this party, it was not said to be a common environment and no one knows exactly why that was, but there are many theories. Now, one was that these friends were still angry from the night before that Gemma hadn't let them into the bars, that they were now going to be watched and some believe that they were already upset at Gemma because Gemma was being accused by Chantel of taking $800 from her purse and not giving it back. It might have been from something completely different. We do not know why this escalated so much so quickly. That is when they would tell the story of what happened next and this was that Gemma was thrown against the radiator and she started bleeding. They then broke her nose and hit her with a mop. They then forced her to drink urine and locked her in a bathroom and she did not have her phone because they flushed the battery down the toilet. Now, she then was told that they were finally going to walk her home. And that is when they headed in that direction. And when they got to this railway, they beat her again. They put a plastic bag over her head. They stripped her and they killed her. Gemma had grown up in circumstances that weren't made to benefit her and yet she overcame her struggles every time. Just when she was feeling that independence that she wanted, her life had been taken. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Gemma and you know what kind of got her not to this point but the things that could have possibly prevented this. And this was to no fault of Gemma or her family, but when Gemma was little, she had gone to a regular school, through elementary school, through middle school, and this was something that her family had to watch her struggle with because they knew she was struggling. They knew that this was not work that she could do. This was too much for her and yet nobody would do anything about it. They simply said she was doing fine and, you know, passed her from grade to grade to grade. They asked the schools as well as social services to get more help for Gemma and they said to, since she didn't have an official diagnosis, there was nothing they could do to help her. This is something that happens all the time when kids are just shuffled through school and they're working so incredibly hard and they're doing everything they can to barely pass and nobody seems to care. They just continue pushing them through the whole school system like they're not struggling. Finally, when she was 14 years old, just going into high school, she was allowed to go to a special school. But even then, they said she didn't have a significant learning disability and they almost thought that she didn't belong there. All sorts of different agencies were contacted by her family to get her help. I mean, almost 200 of them looked at Gemma and her case and her needs, but no one gave her any support. By 18, she was finally diagnosed with being on the autistic spectrum for a while, and she was able to attend a residential college in Wales, which would help her, you know, with learning as well as learning different skills to help her as an adult. This was incredible, and her family was so thrilled, but they were a little bit worried that, you know, she was leaving for the first time. They were really worried because they knew Gemma was very vulnerable because she never told on people who were doing bad, even if it was to her. And so they just wanted to make sure she would be taken care of. And thankfully, because there were people there watching them, she did okay. However, after that, Gemma would have to go into the adult social care services. And at first she was eligible. This would help her with diet, housing, cleaning, money management. And this got her at the age of 21 into supported housing. 
However, shortly after, the adult social care services suddenly stopped helping her and said that her diagnosis that she had gotten at 18 was false and that she wasn't on the autistic spectrum at all. This was even after people looking after Gemma were saying she had trouble communicating, she didn't want to be treated like a child, so she didn't want to be taken care of by her family, but she also was having trouble doing it herself. This meant to them that she was going to do whatever it took, even putting herself at risk to be independent, and that she couldn't really tell right from wrong, especially when somebody else was doing it. So by 2016, when Gemma was 23 years old, she was again referred to mental health services because she was no longer under this adult social services. They had to go under that for the mental health services. This was because she was being aggressive. She was refusing assessments. And still, adult social care said she didn't need any help. She ended up being evicted from this apartment because of that. And she was put into more, you know, regular apartments, regular housing. No one was looking after her to make sure she was okay. And her family tried but were denied by her every time. By the next year, Gemma was still struggling with her mental health and she wasn't making proper decisions for herself. Her family was trying and they were getting denied, like I said, and they didn't know what else to do because technically she was an adult and could live on her own. They couldn't force her to stay at home. That's when she began going into psychiatric and psychological testing and she was, you know, assigned a psychiatric nurse to go and see every once in a while, but unfortunately the behavior and the lifestyle that Gemma was now involved in was getting worse. She was not going to her assessments anymore and without social care services looking after her, no one could force her to do any of this. So her family couldn't even at this point go into her apartment. She was refusing and they didn't know why, but they feared it was because she wasn't taking care of it or herself at all. Her family even remembers a time when Gemma had told them that she was going into town with some friends to get some things for them. And this was actually just Gemma being swindled into stealing for them or depositing her small amount of money that she got you know, every month for her benefits and spending it all on them just because they said that they were her friends and she would do anything for her friends. She was actually getting caught for stealing and this was happening multiple times. Every time she was arrested, the police would call adult social services to say, you know, look, something needs to be done. This keeps happening. And the police were told there was nothing that they could do. Basically, they were told to contact the mental health services that weren't doing anything either. She would eventually have to leave that apartment as well and would be considered homeless by the Rugby Council housing department and they would actually provide her with a place to live where they would be paying her bills. Now, this was really nice because she didn't have that added pressure of having to, you know, use her benefits to pay and all of that and she also didn't have to be looked over by superiors who were taking care of her. Unfortunately, these apartments were speculated to be where a lot of criminals and drug dealers were trying to either integrate into society from being in jail or who were just placed there because they didn't have anywhere else to go. By 2009, a year before her murder, nobody was supporting her and she was really beginning to show symptoms of a chaotic lifestyle. She was not attending proper meetings because no one was there to hold her accountable. And by May of 2010, just four months prior, police were actually contacted about Gemma being sexually assaulted. Gemma was found to be no longer taking care of herself at all. Her place was a mess. She was on the verge of eviction by that August. And the only positive in her life was that she had those friends. She believed these were the only people that had her best interest at heart because social services definitely didn't. And she had refused help by her family at this point too. This is when it is believed that Gemma became a victim of cuckooing, I think is how you say it, which is a term I actually hadn't heard before. But if you don't know either, this is actually when drug dealers will take over the home of a vulnerable person and use it as a place to traffic drugs. And basically the term comes from the bird who takes over other birds' nests for its children. Now, Gemma had even told her family that she was keeping presents from her friends in order to give them out to other people and make them happy. I guess to the drug dealers, she was making them happy, but she had no idea what she was really doing. Chantel was even said to shave off all of Gemma's hair at once just because she simply wanted to. She seemed to be very controlling of Gemma and only use her when she needed her for something. When Gemma's body was found, her family got the first glimpse of what her apartment really looked like and how she'd been living 
all this time. It was filthy. It was disgusting. There was trash everywhere. It was in complete shambles and it appeared that it had never been cleaned. She was also missing a lot of, you know, items like furniture that her family had provided when she moved in. And they said it was probably because she just gave it to people. If they said they liked it, she would just hand it over. Five people she believed to be her friends were now being charged with her murder, as well as it being a mate crime. Not a hate crime, a mate crime. Well, it was also a hate crime, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but they were at first being looked at as committing a mate crime, and this is actually the bullying, abuse, or harassment of people who claim to be your friends and will take advantage of you for their personal gain while making you feel like they are your besties. While awaiting trial, Joe was actually writing letters saying that he was excited to be sentenced and he couldn't wait to, you know, live the rest of his life in there, and at trial at the Old Bailey, the five friends actually pleaded not guilty. The judge would say that this was vile torture of Miss Hader and that it was a chronicle of heartlessness. She also said it was difficult to find the words to express how vile their behavior was and she struggled to see how much lower they could have sunk. She also said that Jim attacked along battered in pain and unsuspecting like a faithful loving dog as they walked her to her death. She directly told Chantel, Over the years, you treated Jim a hater like a toy to be picked up and put down, dependent, I suspect, on whether there was a gap in your miserable life which she could fill. All of them showed zero remorse at the trial, even laughing and talking the entire time. Now, because this was a disability hate crime, of course, you know, a crime done to somebody because of their disability, the judge was able to give them longer sentences. Now, this was to hopefully make an example out of them that this was not going to be allowed. And this was because, you know, hate crime against disabled people was rising and it's still rising. And people are afraid that it's just going to get worse because of people who were taken advantage of for being vulnerable. And of course, these services aren't there to help them like we've seen in this case. Now, Chantel, Daniel, and Joe were all found guilty of murder. Chantel was given 21 years, Daniel was given 20, while Joe was given 16, and Jessica and Duncan were found guilty of manslaughter, which gave Jessica 13 years, while Duncan was given 15. They were all also convicted of assault associating actual bodily harm. Now, this was the best news for Jim's family. And they said, Our Jim was a very loving and vulnerable woman who trusted everyone and her trusting nature and vulnerability led to her death on August 9th last year. Her family has found the last year and now especially the last seven weeks incredibly difficult and today we welcome the jury's verdict. Now our family can move on and hopefully do whatever we can to help prevent anything like this happening again to another vulnerable adult in the future. Now the Warwickshire authorities actually went into a serious case review, which I will link down below I found online, that describes in detail the lack of help that Jim had gotten all through your years, the, the lack of help the family got, and just how much the system failed her. And I love that there is actually written proof of this. It's not just something that we have all gathered and we know there is written proof, which is something that doesn't happen a lot. Although, you know, this isn't enough. It needs to change as well. But for seven years, between 2001 and 2008, Jimma had 11 assessments for adult social care put on by people who believed that she needed help, and yet every single one of them was denied. After maybe, you know, the second one, the third one, don't you think that that's grounds enough to get her help if people that many times say she needs it? There were also 23 missed opportunities where Gemma could have been helped by adult social services, and nine of them happened in the year prior to her murder. And yet, these were all missed. There was also a statement made in 2004 about sexual assault where Gemma contacted the police and they had talked to adult social services about capacity to consent to sexual intercourse. And, you know, they tried to say this entire time that Gemma was the one refusing all this help, that it wasn't them, that that's why they closed the case, was that she didn't want the, the help. However, it wasn't that Gemma didn't want help just because she didn't want it from her family. She wanted to be able to do it and get help herself. And 
This was proven by a note that Shima had wrote in 2008. She sent this to authorities and she told them what she needed and wanted. She said she wanted her own flat and to be treated like an adult, but for someone to help her with the cleaning and the laundry as well as to get a job. She also just wanted someone to have to help her in general with things that she didn't know how to do or just anything, but this never happened. She personally was asking for help two years before her murder and her family had been asking for help since she was born. 27 years of nothing but fighting and Jimma lost her battle to the hands of people who took advantage of her. Her mother, she was a child, kept going back to authorities and she was humiliated when they began calling her an attention seeker, that nothing was wrong with her daughter. She just wanted there to be something with her daughter. She said that her, Gemma's last diagnosis was actually of conduct disorder, which is more of a behavioral problem than anything. And this is often referred to as ODD or oppositional defiant disorder. And this can cause someone to have aggression and disruptive behaviors and be disobedient to authority. I believe we've talked about it here on this channel before, but if you didn't know, it is basically where you are believed to not do well with authority. Now, this is often coupled with another diagnosis like childhood ADHD. People can be seen to be defiant toward authority because of that or more you know even serious mental illnesses but i believe there is much more to Gemma than just behavioral things and should have had a further diagnosis than that and unfortunately we will never know what made Gemma the woman that she was we can speculate it was autism, but no one cared to figure that out. The independent chair of this case review actually said, while there was no evidence that Gemma's murder could have been prevented or predicted, if she had received and accepted better support, she may have lived a better life and been less likely to fall into the company of people who presented serious risks. Maybe if you would have helped her family long before then, they wouldn't be so angry about it now because this wouldn't have happened now. Of course, that's just my personal opinion, but authorities have said that there are now steps in place to prevent this from happening again, but it's going to take pressure. It's going to take awareness because I may not be super aware of the social services in England, but I can tell you the ones in the United States are just as bad, if not worse. I've seen a lot of um, foster care advertisements, actually, of wanting people to become foster parents, become adoptive parents, and... I would just tell you there's a reason for that. Where there is lack, there is probably mistreatment. There is probably some deception. And maybe one day I will tell you just how much I know about that. Families are not listened to at all. And children are passed through the systems with little help and as much cover up as possible and needs that won't ever be met. I think if a family is asking for help, they know the child better than you do. And you give them that help. There should be no doubt about it. I truly hope that Gemma Hader's story changes the world because she deserves to have that kind of impact since she couldn't have it here on earth. And another great example of this story is the case of Ellie Butler, which I did a while back and I will link that down below. That one's extremely hard to hear as well but it's something that needs to be told. So I really hope that these stories teach you things that you didn't know or help you to see things in a different light and maybe make you see things from the parents of individuals with disabilities or mental illness differently because I think parents can often be blamed for not getting enough help or for struggling when really it's that they, they are trying really, really, really hard and are getting nothing in return until there's a super bad outcome. And then people want to blame them when they did everything they could. And that stigma of blaming the parents, whether that's adoptive parents, whether that's foster care parents, whether that's the parent of, you know, a disabled person, the parent of someone with mental illnesses, the stigma of blaming the parent is not always the right way to go about it. Think about what they could have gone through, who they begged and begged and begged and who denied them. 
I'm really happy to share stories like these because I feel like the social services, I can give you guys a different perspective. And I know that some of you like to fight me on that. And some of you kind of, you know, like to have super um, negative opinions about what I say. And I'll just tell you that I've grown up my entire life knowing a lot about the social services. And I think until you live it, you'll never know the half of it. Because most of us are so scarred that we can't speak about it. And although it's hard for me, I won't stop. Because I know that there are people out there who are too scared to talk, who are too broken to do so, and so I will do it for them. I will do it for people like Gemma. I will do it for families like Gemma's family. And I hope that those of you who like to say that stuff like this doesn't happen or it is the family's fault, that you just listen and maybe you change your opinion. Maybe you think about it in a different way. So, yeah, don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.